I am the coordinator for the OSU Extension Land Steward Program, and this is one of our monthly or bi-monthly offerings that we put together for the community. So thank you for joining us. And tonight we are going to hear about weed control and soil development using tarping and solarization from Scott Good and Anna Eichner. And I'll put my other slides at the end if we still have time and we need those, but I think that is enough for us to get going. I'm just gonna let Scott and Anna take it away. Okay. All right, uh, can everybody see the uh, introductory slide? Looks good, Scott. Okay, okay. Um, so this presentation is sort of built off of a presentation that Anna did uh, to uh, uh, um, a Master Gardeners group. And, uh, uh, you know, recently, well, I, I know that the um, uh, Rogue Native Plant Partnership, when they put in their um, uh, planting out at um, the extension, that they used tarping. And so there were some questions about how tarping works and so forth. And so uh, I thought I would delve in, into it a, look, a little bit and, and look at the science kind of behind the difference between uh, solarization and, um, and tarping. And um, uh, what I discovered was that tarping is emerging as a major piece of regenerative agriculture because it's one of the few ways that you can uh, kill off a cover crop or control weeds without doing any plowing. Uh, and that the tarping is becoming actually a, 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 the a usual method for um, uh, ending cover crops and controlling weeds uh, and for, for actually a number of reasons, but um, okay. You go the down one? Okay. Uh, okay. What? There. Oh, okay, so um, uh, okay, so the the difference between solarization and tarping is that solarization uses clear plastic, uh, and it lets the light and the heat through, and as a result, it'll heat uh, uh, the soil up and the air underneath the uh, the the tarp up to uh, depending on what your latitude is in in this area and and part south it can get the, the soil surface temperature and the temperature down two or three inches to up to 160 degrees. And that's enough to kill many pests. Uh, but uh, uh, in the Northern climes, they use solarization to uh, warm the soil earlier in the season so they can actually get their crops in. And uh, in New Hampshire and Maine and in uh, Quebec, this is becoming a very, very common uh, practice for two things. One, you put the uh, solarization down, it'll bring up the weeds, and then one way or another, you can kill the weeds and then plant your crop. Or you can uh, put the solarization on, and if there really aren't any, any weeds, it'll get the soil temperature up to, te uh, uh, to temperature for planting uh, weeks ahead of uh, the competition. And so that's why it's becoming quite, quite popular. Uh, uh, and uh, depending on how well you seal the solarization panels and so forth, you can accomplish some different things. Now, uh, with tarping, you're using not light, but darkness to kill the weeds uh, uh, and um, uh, or suppress weeds uh, from, um, from expressing themselves. But uh, one of the major things that tarping does is that once you cover the ground with the tarp, as far as anything on or in the ground uh, knows, it's in the dark and it stays in the dark for quite some time. And that replicates uh, the conditions in a deep old growth forest. And so as since the critters think that they're in an old uh, growth forest, the um, uh, the biology in the soil begins to shift. And what happens, it goes from a bacterially dominant system that you would find in uh, disturbed land or so forth, and it shifts it uh, into higher and higher fungal assemblages, um, which uh, is another really, really good way of, of controlling weeds. But another thing that it does is in that darkness, 
varieties of voles and uh, pocket gophers and worms all come to the surface. And after you pull the tarp back, you'll see that the entire surface of the ground for about six inches down has been completely cultivated, what they call biocultivation, by all of these critters. And in, and in the process, they're leaving behind all their uh, waste products and uh, 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 moving the soil around. And so you end up with a very, very rich, well-cultivated soil without ever even really touching it. And so that's what we do every year on, on all of our garden beds. We grow a cover crop, we chop it off, uh, uh, we uh, compost the cover crop, but uh, we cover the ground as soon as the cover crop is off, leaving the roots and, and the stems. And within about three weeks, uh, the worms have come through and completely digested that material, along with all the nitrogen uh, nodules in it. And you have a, a pre-cultivated uh, planting bed. And it, it, it's so beautiful that in general, other than possibly raking it off to get better soil con uh, seed soil contact, uh, you have a, a perfectly ready uh, planting bed without ever doing any work. And this will happen year after year after year. And the soil just gets richer and richer in the process. Uh, and then, uh, what? No, I, I can't see the last line. So uh, kill and incorporate uh, something. Cover crops. Anyway, OK. So oh, yes, uh, and uh, kill and incorporate uh, cover crop. I'm sorry, I can't see the whole screen here, so I have to. OK, so this is uh, what you traditionally use for uh, solarization, six mil polyethylene. Those are the prices of the uh, material. And you notice I kept included in there a compost thermometer. Without actually testing the temperature of your soil at the level uh, that you're, uh, you know, going after a, a pest, uh, you never, you, you, you cannot really track what temperature you're actually getting to. And so that's one of the things that they talk about in solarization. You pretty much need a thermometer to verify that you're accomplishing the le uh, lethal temperatures that you're going after. Uh, and so uh, uh, I think we pretty much went over. The, oh, one of the things, if you're trying to solarize uh, for pest management, you have to make sure that the pest isn't mobile because when you heat up the soil, it'll just leave and go someplace else. So like for instance, nematodes, often they try to use um, solarization to kill nematodes, but all that happens when, is when the soil warms up, the nematodes move out of the way and then move back in when the soil cools off. Um, and um, like I said, you need to verify that, that you're getting to the right temperatures uh, uh, in order to kill the pests. Um, uh, soil moisture underneath. What? Is the, the soil moisture content cloud cover, the shade intensity. Oh, yeah, no, the thing that, uh, one of the things about solarization is if you don't have, um, uh, if you have a lot of cloudiness or you're trying to do it where you have partial shade during the day or anything like that, anything that gets in the way of the sunlight will lower the effectiveness of, of um, the solarization. Uh, and there are a lot of weeds that if you cover them with clear plastic, they'll grow like crazy. And so you have to know which weeds you're going after and, and whether or not they're, they're heat tolerant. So the, the, this sort of shows you the differences between the, the temperatures that are generated by solarization, tarping, and control is just bare soil. And so you can see that uh, in the kind of gold colored, the, uh, the spikes in the temperature get quite a bit uh, warmer uh, than in the soils. Now, this um, chart came from a, a um, project that was done in Maine. Now it doesn't get nearly as hot in Maine in the summertime as it does here. So these temperatures are well below the temperatures that you would see under solarization in this part of the country. And then you can see the darker line, the darkest line, that's what would happen under, under tarping. And so you see, you did do get a little bit of uh, temperature increase but in general, what happens with the tarps the, uh, is the tarp, hit, uh, the sunlight hits the tarp, 
warms up the tarp, and then a little of the heat that is in that tarp will radiate down uh, into the soil, but most of it radiates back out in, into the atmosphere. And that's why you don't get the temperature spikes that you would with a clear plastic solarization. But it's still effective enough that it holds the soil temperature a bit above what uh, bare soil uh, temperature would be. Okay, so here's just to give you an idea of how solarization might work. You can see that nematodes, if they stay in place, all you have to do is get up to 120 degrees for 15 minutes and they're done. So you don't need to solarize all summer long in order to accomplish that. Most uh, plant pathogens die, you see at 140 degrees for 30 minutes. Uh, and most weeds will die at 158 to 168 degrees for 15 minutes. So you see that you can kill stuff off pretty, pretty quickly with solarization. Um, but uh, most of the uh, recommendations say that you should keep the solarization on for at least a week, just to make sure that uh, you know, it has actually gotten up to the right temperatures uh, and, and so forth. And um, you can see that in, in this uh, uh, other slide that uh, uh, Phytophthora, you can kill Phytophthora um, uh, spores or, or uh, um, molds uh, within a fairly short period of time uh, with, uh, you know, temperatures that, you know, are, are below 130. So that gives you a sense of, oh, and the uh, um, Solanaceae C dies off, you know, pretty quickly as well. So this is what people are trying to accomplish when they're doing solarization. Uh, and it can be quite effective as long as the critters don't run away. So I'll stop right quick here and see if there's any questions about, about the solarization part of this. We come up with any questions here? Yes, there were a couple of questions here. Um, Henry asked, <clears throat> does it shift the pH of the soil? So I'm not sure which, which thing, but maybe either process. No, neither one of the processes will change the pH of the soil. Uh, you have to have, you know, somehow hydrogen ions coming into the soil and with the decomposition of the organic matter, um, all of that decomposition is happening in the top uh, two or three inches of the soil where the biology pretty much takes it apart and leaves it uh, neutral. So um, there's really no process there that would change the pH. And in okay. none of the studies that I looked, they track pH as a part of it and then none of them did they show a change in pH. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so another question from Elizabeth, what about combining tarping with solarization for problem weeds like Italian arum? Um, now, I, I haven't seen any literature on Italian arum and it's really a, a challenging uh, plant. And the other thing is I think it, it often grows in shady areas. So, you know, <laughs> it would have to be growing in the full sunlight for either of these to work. But using both uh, clear and black plastic is something that's used uh, in the northern climes, like I said, for increasing uh, uh, soil temperature. So what they'll do is they'll put down the clear plastic, lay it down, let it uh, warm up the soil, get a good expression of weeds, then pull the black plastic across that, leave it on uh, like a week or whatever, uh, just long enough to kill off uh, the weed seeds, and then pull that back. And then that keeps your uh, uh, soil temperature up and also kills off the weeds. And um, like I said, that's used as a uh, pretty widely in northern climes for, okay. once again, getting the soil warm early and killing off any, any weeds that might come up. Okay. And then what millimeter size of the solarization plastic? Yeah, it's six mil clear poly. Uh, in, any material thinner than that will just uh, be torn apart by wind or weeds. So okay. standard is six mil poly. Now, if uh, you were planning on using it for more than a year or two, then you would probably want to go ahead and get greenhouse plastic, six mil greenhouse plastic, because it's UV resistant and as much, much more durable. 
Okay. And then um, let's see. You mentioned that there were a few things that it wouldn't work on. What weeds in our area will it not work on? Doc. So far, dock is the only thing <laughs> that you, you have to hand remove dock and you have to remove the root. You just cut it off, makes no difference to it at all. Um, but some of the more challenging ones are bindweed. Bindweed, you have to keep it tarped pretty much for an entire season to kill off an infestation of bindweed. And initially when you, uh, tarp the bindweed. Uh, oh, and bindweed loves lots of heat, so that's out. But when you first tarp the, uh, the bindweed, the first thing it does is start to proliferate with pure white leaves. So apparently it doesn't need to photosynthesize in order to, in order to go. So I, I'm assuming it's pulling off of, of uh, uh, stored nutrients in the roots. But what, what its strategy is, oh, I'm in the dark. If I grow far enough, I will climb out of underneath the dark. And if you are willing to keep up with that, like pull it back underneath the dark when into the dark, you know, when it gets out and that sort of thing. Uh, it took me about a year, but I finally got rid of all of the bindweed that, that, that came up. Uh, and on bunch grasses, it, uh, it makes a whole lot more sense to mow the bunch grasses down to I mean the nub, just completely overgraze them. Uh, and uh, a good hardy weed whacker will, will do a good job of grinding it off to, down to a stub. Uh, and so you may need to pre-treat by doing heavy mowing uh, on uh, you know, resistant bunch grasses. So those are the ones that so far we've had a little challenge on, but everything else that I've tried it on, it, it's worked well. well. Okay, um, I'm, uh, we have some more questions here, but I'm a little concerned about time. And I know that you have a lot to talk about. So I'm gonna take a pause on the questions here for a moment and let you continue and we'll see, maybe you'll get to some of these answers as sure. we go. We can come okay. to them at the end. Okay, so what tarping has to offer is that, it, like I said, it, it shifts the biolo biological succession from disturbed land biology, which is bacterially dominant, to more forested uh, biology, which is uh, fungally dominated. Now, one of the things that this does is that there's a lot of studies out now that show that um, weeds are not persistent from year to year if they're allowed to go through uh, their succession. In other words, the first thing that's gonna come out are grasses uh, and they'll, they'll grow up big, but over the course of time, if they're not disturbed, then other forbs will come in and take over. And as they do that, they start to shift the, the soil biology from a strong uh, bacterially dominated uh, uh, environment where your grasses are and start shifting to a more fungally dominated um, system uh, that as, as it get, gets into larger and larger forbs. And just like with the solar, uh, well, uh, an important part of it is, like I said, the bioturbation that the critters do to the soil while they're covered up. And one of the beautiful things is, and this really works well, if you'll go ahead and carefully uh, mow down everything that you're going to put under the tarp, get it on the ground, because once it's on the ground, critters can start, and plus it's dead, uh, the critters will come in and they'll start turning it into uh, uh, mulch or compost really pretty pretty effectively and pretty quickly. And so what you're doing is you're taking and you're converting your weeds into worm food and, and they'll really take off too. So this is, as I was saying, this is the sequence of um, uh, the transition in fungal to bacterial balance as you go from a bare soil, which will be 100% bacterial. There's nothing there for fungus uh, to deal with other than digesting the rocks if they're part of a uh, lichen. But apart from that, okay, so in the zone where you have, um, in, in here where you have grasses and weeds and your fungal to bacterial ratio is 0.1. In other words, there's 10 times more bacteria than there are fungi uh, in the soil. And as the grasses give way to the mixed herbaceous plants, and this is the zone where vegetable gardens thrive. And that's for a fungal uh, to bacterial 
uh, ratio of the um, uh, you know, uh, uh, 75, uh, yeah, 75% uh, bacteria. Uh, and then as the bushes come along, you get into a two to one ratio up to a five to one ratio. And so the zone that's uh, from say uh, one to one ratio up to five to one ratio is the zone in which really, really hammers weeds. They just won't come up. They don't have the, uh, the bacterial ensemble to really keep them going. Um, so you're using that succession uh, uh, process uh, to your advantage with this. And this is an example of the bioturbation. So these are uh, pocket gopher burrows. Now, normally a pocket gopher would be hiding down in the grass or maybe even deeper in the soil. But with a tarp on top of it, they're perfectly happy to just run along at the surface. And um, if you're worried about, uh, you know, building up a huge population of, of uh, these pocket gophers, really all you have to do is it, uh, some evening where you know that this is, these guys are present, just pull back the tarp and the owls and the cats will come in and clean them up. I mean, it's amazing to watch. Uh, and if um, you uh, are uh, uh, paying attention enough to, you can tell when uh, they, uh, uh, these critters pop, you can tell when their offspring are there. And if you go out and pull up the tarp right then, you'll pretty well nail the population. And so they're very easy to control if with a little integrated pest management, which is all about knowing when and what to do at the critical points. So here's an example of, of some tarping. And you can see, we just pulled the tarp over uh, tall grass and it kills it very, very effectively. And if you look, uh, there's a couple of places on, on that in, in, in the grass where you can see little holes. There's two or three of them on there. And those are where those uh, rodent, uh, rodent dens have completely uh, bioturbated the soil underneath that grass. So these are the materials that are generally used uh, for tarping. Uh, now we use the six foot wide uh, landscape fabric uh, in our garden beds because they're just uh, large enough to cover uh, an 18 uh, inch wide walkway and a four foot wide bed. And so we can cover our entire garden with these uh, pieces of, of landscape fabric that are six feet long and, and the length of the bed. And then we just fold them up and keep them in the, uh, in the walkways between the planted area when we're not using it. And then there's a classic uh, six mil um, polyethylene. Uh, it's available in lots and lots of different sizes. If you're just getting started, small, start small and work your way up. So you can kind of get used to the way that works. And polyeth a black poly will last for three or four years, maybe five if, if you really take care of it. But when it, you want to get rid of it, before it starts to deteriorate. Because when it starts falling apart and you get little chips of polyethylene scattered over your property, well, it, you know, kind of defeating some of your purposes there. Another thing that in the past, and, and we use these a lot just because we inherited them from uh, defunct. A, a defunct operations nearby, let's put it that way. Um, and they used to be incredibly cheap, um, but, uh, they're uh, 14 feet by 48 feet. There are, there are other sizes, but that's the most common. And they used to be about oh, $20 a piece or something like that. You could buy a whole pallet for not very much money, but apparently they become quite property uh, or popular because now they're $75 uh, a sheet. And uh, these things weigh, oh, probably 50 pounds or something like that when they're all folded up. So they're, they're not light. Uh, and so often um, shipping is an issue as well. And most people that do tarping for, uh, you know, agricultural scale tarping use silage covers, sometimes called panda cloth. Um, and it's uh, white on one side, black on the other. Um, uh, it's much, much more durable than uh, regular polyethylene. 
Uh, and so most people that, that are using uh, tarping uh, year to year will use these uh, uh, silage covers. And you can order them in any, any size you want. Uh, uh, you know, uh, they go up to 100 feet by 100 feet. Uh, so uh, you can really uh, customize them. And they're a lot lighter than the, than the billboard, so they're easier to handle and uh, shipping is a lot less. Uh, and the other thing, most commonly, uh, uh, sandbags are used to hold down the tarps. And if there is any major drawback to uh, tarping, it is that uh, they're very, very uh, tough to keep down in the wind. Now, if, if you're used to sailing offshore, being under sail offshore, handling three quarters of an acre, acre of tarps is, is not that bad. You get used to it, kind of get the trim tabs all lined up. And as long as they're oriented in the right direction, they'll stay there pretty well. But uh, if you're just experimenting with it, the critical thing is, is that you have to have the uh, tarps laying such that uh, there is a tarp overlaying a tarp below it uh, such that the over, uh, tarp that's on top is upwind of uh, the downwind tarp. And what that does is the stronger the wind blows, the more it holds the tarp down. And what lifts tarps up is just even the most tiny breeze that can get under a tarp, it'll loft it very, very quickly. But even in the past uh, weeks where we've had very strong winds, I have them all laid to where they're overlapping in just the right direction. And I've had no trouble at all uh, keeping it in place. Unless, of course, the wind changes. And then you've got to go over and flip the tarps in the other direction. And at three quarters of an acre, that's a lot of tarps. So, but that's, everybody agrees, the only downside of tarping is to, trying to keep them uh, out of the wind and standardly. Um, uh, uh, sandbags are the way that that's done. So here's an example of the landscape fabric. This is what we use in, in our gardens. And you can see uh, it very effectively covers up um, the entire garden space. Uh, this is um, what we've done here is we've just finished up with our winter cover crop. We've harvested off the fava beans and put them in the trenches for composting but we leave the stubble and the roots in place and we cover over and within, uh, we just track until the soil temperature gets up uh, to the right temperature for whatever crop we're gonna put in. And generally by then, the material underneath the tarp is completely decomposed. And the more years you do this, the more worms you're gonna have in the soil and the quicker that decomposition will occur. So this is the six mil poly. I have this kind of all, you know, crumpled up here just to, you know, that, that's often the way you find it. <laughs> so like, anyway, so six mil poly, people are pretty uh, familiar with that, I'm sure. This is a close up of the vinyl billboards. And you can see that's, that it's a fabric that has been coated with vinyl. Now there's a couple of things about this. One, vinyl is not a recognized uh, amendment uh, by Oregon Tilth or any of the, um, or um, any of the uh, 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 organizations that track um, uh, organic uh, materials. And so it's not, uh, the fact that it stays above the ground, it doesn't get incorporated, I don't mind it too much, but you can't use it if you have a uh, organic certified farm. The other thing is that that fabric that you see in there, that's made out of fiberglass. Very tough, but once it begins to decompose, and you can kind of see in, in, in this picture, you can see a little place where it's beginning to decompose. And when it does, those fiberglass fibers become very, very apparent. And if you um, are not really, really careful, you can get splinters in your hands. So what I'm very careful to do is anytime I see one of the tarps beginning to deteriorate, I, I retire it to, uh, a, a more permanent position that I'm not going to have to mess with it. Eventually, all of the tarps that I have, I'm going to be using as a 
pond liner for my uh, uh, irrigation bulge ponds. So they'll be at the bottom of a pond by the time they start to really decompose. I think they'll be pretty safe down here. Uh, and, and here's the uh, uh, silage cover, often called uh, panda tarp. And um, it's relatively common that you can find a greenhouse that's no longer in production and they'll have quite a bit of this around. I, I found actually a remarkable amount of it just kind of laying around. So it is possible to, to find it uh, as a surplus. Okay, and this is why you don't buy cheap sandbags. They will completely deteriorate in a relatively short period of time. And so when you go through, and uh, I think we have a link to uh, some places to get sandbags. I thought I put it in. Mm -hmm. uh, at any rate, um, uh, they, there will be a list of sandbags and then there'll be a list of durable sandbags. Go ahead and get the durable sandbags. They're not that much more. And when you have these things coming apart in the field, it's no fun at all. And use rounded gravel. Oh, and uh, use sand or bird's eye gravel or pea gravel or something like that. Because if you use three quarter minus or something that's sharp, uh, it'll chew up the bags pretty fast. Okay, so it, uh, tarping is an, a great way of killing off a lot of weeds without pulling anything. Pulling out of tarps, pretty, pretty quick, pretty easy. Um, once again, you're replicating the process of succession in order to get rid, to shift the biology. Um, and you're increasing the fungal to bacterial uh, uh, component. Um, and this, this, I think we've gone over. Uh, so here's an example of just how fast tarping works. Here you can see at one week, you know, the weeds that are there are pretty much still intact. Um, you know, if you pull it back, they're, they're gonna, uh, uh, you know, come right back. And then after three weeks, everything is pretty toasted. And, you know, the dock and a few of those things will still be uh, uh, okay. But most of it uh, is, uh, uh, most of the material is pretty well gone. And you can see in the last, this is this, um, what we call worm cheese or bioturbation. The results is, as a, uh, uh, doing the tarping. And, you know, the critters that are in there, under there just basically turn the, uh, the biomass that's, that's there into, uh, yeah, into compost. Once again, this is the, the process that we're trying to, to work our way uh, through with uh, uh, shifting the biology of the soil. And as that dark uh, layer uh, uh, material covers, covers over, you will be able to see fungus growing, particularly if you have the bi uh, biomass that's uh, decomposing. And you'll see this fungal hyphae beginning to, to uh, spread underneath the tarp. And once again, there's our bioturbation. Okay, any questions about tarping or uh, occultation in general, I can take them now. What I'm about to do is go in to specific, there are three kind of stages of tarping, garden, a uh, uh, small landowner, and then agriculture. So I can take questions or I can wait to the end. Um, I There are a bunch of questions here, but some of them you're, you've been kind of answering as we go. I think let's maybe do one and then, okay. and then we'll come back at the end. Um, Someone says, which humidity under the soil is recommended under the tarp? This person lives in a very dry area. So do you need right. a certain moisture? It depends on, the, on, on, on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, the, the wetter the soil is, the higher the heat capacity of the soil is. And so the wetter it is, the less it will heat up. And if you have a soil that's really, really saturated, I mean, just wet, and you put the tarp over it, the first thing will happen is all the water will evaporate, condense on the inside of the, of the uh, solarization fabric. And then uh, that will reflect all that water, those water droplets will reflect most of the light that's coming in. So- um, You're solarizing. It, it, yeah, if you're solarizing. So um, uh, for most of the, of the um, applications, you want a good 
dry soil in order to heat up really effectively. Uh, and um, uh, th there were a couple of studies where they were wanted to um, get um, uh, plants to um, sprout out, and then they were using the solarization to kill them off. And in that case, that was the only condition in which they wanted to have high soil moisture to begin with. But as far as the efficacy of the thermal side of, of, um, of solarization, uh, a dry soil works much more effectively than uh, moist soil. And what about if for tarping? Uh, and in tarping, uh, it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, the thing that's killing the plants is darkness. So the moisture really doesn't matter. Um, but if it's moist, it go works faster. Yeah, it, 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 if you have moisture down there, there's more biology, more critters in the soil. And so they're gonna decompose the material faster. But as far as killing the plants, it's the darkness that's killing the plants. Okay. okay. Yep. Okay. So folks, we're going to save these just to make sure that we get through the presentation, but we'll go give what we can at the end here. Sure. Okay. So these are the different scales of, of uh, tarping. One's garden tarping. You've sort of seen that. That's, that's the side of it that uh, we use most. Then there's a uh, small landowner scale tarping. And that is, you know, if you have um, a bunch of uh, Medusa head or star thistle or something like that, that you wanted to, uh, you know, completely wipe out just by doing solarization, uh, pardon me, uh, um, uh, tarping, then, you know, that's kind of a larger scale and you'd be using larger pieces of material. And then, as I said, regenerative agriculture has become a critical part of, uh, I mean, pardon me, tarping has become a critical part of a regenerative agriculture because in many, uh, in, under many conditions, it can completely eliminate the need for a tractor. Uh, and we'll look at some pictures of, of how that works in a minute. So this is garden tarping. You can see in this picture, those black um, tarps that have been folded up and they're sitting over the walkways. So it, it keeps the, uh, uh, any weeds or anything. Uh, and of course, in our case, we're, we're composting underneath there and keeping it uh, dark and moist really helps that process. But as you can see, there's not many uh, weeds in this garden. And that's because um, every spring when the weeds come up, as soon as they express themselves, you know, and that starts in February, we deploy the tarps, kill off all the weeds, and then uh, fold them up. If any more uh, uh, weeds come out, we can redeploy them. Or if we want to uh, accelerate the uh, warming of the soil, we can once again leave them in place um, until we're ready to plant. So this is kind of, uh, this. Uh, Anna came up with this as uh, uh, her tool and it's sort of like a circular calendar. So it ought to be popular in this group. So you can see that uh, if you're starting with uh, soil that has weeds on it, if you have tall weeds, you're wanna, going to wanna chop them off as, as short as possible. First of all, because it gets, uh, gets them close to the ground where they can decompose. But the other thing is, that if you have those weeds holding the tarp up, it's really easy for wind to get underneath there and take the tarp away. So cutting off any tall weeds, uh, and you don't have to remove them, just chop them, leave them on the ground, the critters will take, uh, uh, take care of it. If you're um, you know, planning on um, uh, uh, turning it into a garden area, for instance, it's a good idea to take uh, a uh, soil analysis, find out if you need any more extra calcium or anything like that in the soil. Uh, if you were going to do an amendment, it would be fine to put it in underneath uh, at the beginning of tarping. Uh, and then you just cycle around, check the uh, soil temperature uh, and uh, 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 remove the tarp. If you are going to go do direct seeding or something like that, you might want to rake back the uh, residual plant material and save it for uh, using as, um, um, as a mulch. Grasses are planta non grata. <laughs> they, they spread by rhizomes and stolons. 
They're very hard to kill. They uh, uh, don't really contribute much as far as the pollinator uh, content. So we are in a express mode at removing all of the grasses from, from our whole area and completely replacing them with uh, you know, good solid pollinator species that shift the uh, uh, soil biology toward a more fungally dominated uh, uh, environment. Um, and then uh, once that's out of the way, you're ready to uh, uh, plant your crops and then you mulch over it. And uh, so that's how you would use this in, in an uncultivated setting. So here we have uh, some of our favorite non-natives because they bloom all winter long. And I'm telling you, the bumblebees are all over these things now. And we have this stuff growing underneath all, of, uh, all over our orchards. So the orchard's already full of, of pollinators just as, as the uh, trees are beginning to, uh, to, uh, to blossom. But uh, none of these uh, weeds do you need to pull up or remove or anything. Uh, it'd be a good idea to pull out the grasses, but the rest of them, uh, other than dock, you know, you can pretty well leave behind. And so you just cover them up with a, uh, the plastic, just let it rock until everything's uh, digested underneath there and uh, the soil will be nice and warm and you're ready to go. So once again, you can see it's killed off uh, uh, the uh, vegetation. Uh, we have uh, some lots and lots of uh, bioturbation going on in the soil and uh, it, it leaves a beautiful surface to, or a much easier surface to plant in than if it was full of weeds. And there you can see all of the nice uh, brown, ready to plant soil. And if you drug a rake through that, you'd, you'd see that it's all nice and fluffy right on the surface. Um, and we, I, I think, pretty much covered this one. Okay. Uh, now, um, actually, let me look here. So it, um, if you have gone through and you, um, uh, are pretty confident that you don't or have a really heavy seed load, you can pull up the tarp and go ahead and plant. But on the other hand, if you know you're going to have a heavy seed load, you can see that from happening, what's happening on the soil around it. You can just pull the tarps over, let, let the weed seeds sprout up until they're an inch or two tall, and then pull that tarp over and cover them up. They'll be dead in a week. They'll be gone. And so you can pull the tarp back up and if you want to plant, you can plant if it's warm enough. Or if the weeds are still a problem, you can cover them again. And, and this is sort of like going through three spring times of weed um, expression in one year. So you can really knock back the uh, uh, weed pressure and the weed load and uh, seed load in the, in the ground just by going through three spring times of emergence and kill off in one year. And once again, it be, leaves a, a really nice fluffy soil on the bottom. What? So the difference with the tarping is if you walk on the tarps yeah. versus if you just leave it and let the critters do their thing, because the critters are still gonna do their thing, yeah. but if you're walking on it, it's yes, if you walk on the tarps, compact. you're going to get some compaction. So we're pretty careful about, you know, minimizing the amount of traipsing across the tarps we do. Um, and depending on what you're going to do, if you're going to put it into a seed bed immediately, compaction isn't really going to help you out much. But uh, if uh, instead you're just, um, you know, uh, removing the Medusa head from a hillside, then you really don't have to worry about compaction. Um, Okay, so um, when, like I said, you can either plant your garden, you can uh, put, uh, uh, once, once the, you're ready to plant, you can go ahead and plant a garden. Uh, you may want to uh, find out whether or not there's going to be a bunch of weeds come up. And in that case, you can plant it in uh, a summer cover crop like uh, um, buckwheat. And buckwheat matures in like six weeks. So you can pretty well let the uh, buckwheat come up, uh, put on lots of nice flowers, bring in the pollinators, and before the uh, weeds uh, can um, flower 
and set seed, you can knock the whole thing down uh, and uh, uh, tarp it uh, uh, or mow it and uh, start with another su succession of cover crop um, and uh, another technique. So here, if you begin the process in the fall, so if you have a cultivated area and you want to begin, you already have a garden going and you want to start using this, this is uh, uh, simply a matter of uh, re removing any crop debris, putting down a nice um, uh, mulch layer. And then if you want, you can plant uh, a winter cover crop, fava beans, um, Austrian winter pea, and this, let them grow through the entire winter time. And they'll uh, uh, grow up the entire time putting uh, uh, nitrogen in the soil, building biomass, keeping the mycorrhizae alive, keeping the biology going, the root exudates are going all uh, winter long. Springtime, they're ready to go. And then depending on what weeds come up in between your cover crop, if they're not, uh, you know, weeds that, um, are troublesome or noxious or something, you can let them grow up right up there in, in your cover crop uh, and then uh, tarp them along with everything else. It's perfectly good biomass. And many of them are really good at concentration uh, nutrients. So here you have our, you know, springtime beds. You can see there uh, off to the left, a little corner of our uh, uh, winter garlic crop. And we've already tarped off the beds uh, in the foreground, getting them warmed up uh, for early planting. Then we have our cover crops going on in the other beds. And uh, if you're not careful, you, you, you can get lost in these things. And if you look very carefully in this, you'll see that Anna has been completely subsumed in uh, biomass there. So, you know, be careful. Uh, and as soon as uh, the uh, fava, uh, fava beans begin to flower, you give it just enough time to make sure that the pollinators have a shot at it, but you don't want to let them go too long because uh, the stems start to get woody. Uh, you start shifting from lots of proteins and, and uh, lipids and uh, juicy. really nutritious, juicy things that go into compost, and they'll start shifting to more and more fibrous and cellulose rich which doesn't do you nearly as much good. But you can either chop the material down, lay it on top of the bed, tarp it, let it go for two, three weeks, or as we do, we uh, take it off and compost the material next to the bed and then cover it just so the critters can take up the, the roots. Uh, and that's what the critters that um, are left behind, you can see there that we've chopped off the top of the, of the fava bean, but the roots are covered with uh, rhizobium nodules and, and full of nitrogen. And uh, the critters will tear that apart and make it into plant available nitrogen pretty quickly in the springtime. And so uh, once again, we've cut off the cover crop that you were just looking at. We've covered it over and uh, letting it warm up for, for uh, uh, springtime planting. And in general, we can plant directly into uh, these soils without ever doing any cultivation. And so um, if, uh, like I said, if, if you decide that for one reason or another, you uh, 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 need more nutrients in the soil or you're afraid of weeds or something, you can plant your silver cover crop of, uh, of um, buckwheat. Increase organic. Yeah, and you can see here, what we do when we uh, plant our buckwheat, we stage it. Uh, you see in the center here, you have buckwheat that's in full flower. And then there's a row that's right next to it that's really just beginning to get, get started um, as far as its growth. And then another one uh, a little older than that. So what that allows us to do is let buckwheat go to flower, pull in the pollinators. And when it starts getting a little rough, uh, uh, by the time it starts getting a little rough, the next uh, batch of buckwheat is already in flower. And so you can cascade with two or three beds through the summertime and keep cover crop in flower the entire time. And then you can do crop rotations into the soil after that if you want to. But you can keep pollinators happy the whole, whole summer long. And so in the rest of the garden, you can see here, there's very, very few weeds. We have our 
uh, occult, occultation material all folded up, ready to go for the next spring. And uh, this, this is a picture that I just took out in, in our uh, uh, yard this year, or in the garden this year, showing uh, the um, cover crop beginning to come up, the fava beans. Be, uh, at this time of year, it kind of hunkers down all winter long, but as soon as it starts getting warm like that, the stuff just explodes. And then you see our um, little uh, uh, garlic crop going there in the background. Okay, so this is once again, just uh, the, the cycle that uh, uh, Anna kind of developed. And so are there any quick questions about uh, the gardening scale of, uh, of occultation or tarping? So here's a pretty straightforward one. And there was a question about the tarping materials too. Will you provide some links about where to buy things, um, the supplies? I, I'm not sure those were in the links at the beginning. That was one question. And then this is about the seeds. Where do you buy your seeds for fava beans and buckwheat? That's been really tough here recently. Um, the uh, local place that I have gotten the seeds in the past, the quality of the seeds were so low the, they're all different sizes. Our germination rates were low. So I've had to go online uh, in order to get really good seeds for, um, for fava beans. My absolute favorite variety of fava beans are called Banner, B-A-N-N-E-R. And uh, last year there weren't any available, but uh, they're huge. They grow fast. They're really high germination rate. And um, uh, they do really, really well here. Uh, so you, buckwheat is really pretty easy, pretty easy to find. Uh, so where, there, where might you recommend? Do you have a website that people could Google or? Well, um, you know, um, all, really all you have to do is Google the name of the plant and you'll get a whole list of different um, places to buy it. Uh, I've traditionally gotten mine from Territorial uh, because they were the main ones that carried banner um, fava beans and they haven't carried them in the last two years so you know i just go out and thrash about the uh, internet until i until i find it uh you can get um uh, uh locally available uh, uh buckwheat seed as i haven't had any trouble with that it's just the fava beans but um uh you know particularly if you're doing a, a large scale um uh uh, planting, uh, you can buy uh, 10, 20, 30 pound bags of, of for instance, fava beans uh, online. Now, remember with fava beans, they're a legume and you need to get the correct um, uh, inoculant for, uh, for fava beans. So for instance, uh, clovers have one inoculum, uh, beans have another, peas have another. Make sure you get the right inoculum for your plant and uh, inoculum always have a expiration date on it. They're, they are live critters in there. Um, and so it's generally a good idea to buy a new batch of uh, inoculum every year. Okay. Cover it? Uh, uh, yeah, if, there if are more has any we'll... questions about, about places and to go and, and stuff like that. I'd be happy to, happy to talk with you about what my experiences currently are. So, okay, yeah. all right. Um, okay, um, let's see. So is, is tar there's a question here about is tarping effective for killing um, ivy, but that might be, you might be going to address that in the next well, version of. As long as the ivy is on the ground and not climbing up in a tree, you have a good shot at it. But if you're trying to kill the ivy by killing it around the base of the tree, it, it won't even affect it because all the vegetation is up, you know, up in the air. But uh, English ivy, um, uh, I've had actually good good uh, luck with uh, uh, tarping that. Nice. Okay, good. We'll let you go on and we'll pick up some more, okay. more towards the end. <clears throat> so this is what I'm talking about in a small landowner. I think of it as sort of land steward scale. If you've got really something you want to knock off. So uh, this is an example of when I thought, oh, I'll just, you know, cover the tall grass and the bugs will eat it up, it'll be fine. No, no, it's a really good idea if you mow it and chop it up really, really fine 
So the bugs can actually do it. Otherwise, you end up with a huge pile of very flammable straw out there that you're going to have to rake up and, and do something. So cut the grass first before you occult it. So here's just an example of, uh, uh, oh, we had a side by side. Thing. Anyway, so this is uh, an example of uh, uh, an area that I uh, needed to get rid of the grass. So you can see on the left there, I put down my tarp and then I've rolled back the tarp and you can see, uh, and you can see by the cherry tree there that I tarped it, uh, oh, probably in June. And then um, I untarped it uh, uh, during the winter. And it did a great job of, of getting rid of the material. But you, boy, once again, these are sort of the scales. You've got a big patch of something you want to get rid of. Uh, tar uh, tarping works pretty good for that. So this is an, an area just to show you what, um, <clears throat> if, if you're not careful, you can get yourself into. So this is our, our uh, it's about a three quarter acre area that I wanted to turn from this into a forest garden. And so uh, I went out and, and you can see that I didn't cut the material in there. You can see the big bulges underneath the tarp. Well, I made it pretty easy for the wind to get under. But he did a pretty good job of, of knocking back the, uh, the grasses. And so this is what happened the next spring. I pulled it back. Uh, I wanted to see what had uh, died and what hadn't. And you can see that there are big areas where it was really effective. But there are some a bunch of grasses out there that will really hang in there. Uh, there's also some spring emergent uh, weeds in there as well. And so. Uh, um, the solution to that, of course, is to come along with more tarps. So this is the second year of tarping. I'm coming in, pulling it in, covering it up, and there it sits. So we let that sit for uh, another season, and that's what it looks like now. Yeah, yeah this was last summer, and you got corn. You, those are all melon vines there on the right, sunflowers, and so and and very very few weeds. So you can turn things, a, a fairly large area can turn it around pretty quickly. And once again, this, what we're doing is shifting that fungal to bacterial ratio. And if you want to garden with no weeds, just make sure that you get your fungal to bacterial <coughs> ratio uh, up to about one to one. And if you, uh, the whole idea of a forest garden is that you have uh, everything from uh, ground cover to great trees and vines and and you're filling the entire volume of your property with uh, different scales of plants. Uh, and so that's taking it closer and closer and closer to uh, uh, a climax forest. And uh, so what you're looking at there is in shifting the fungal bacterial ratio up to about five to one. And once it's there, the soil biology really inhibits the growth of what we think of as weeds and shifts it to um, things you would find in an understory. Go back one. Okay. So you can also use tarps underneath the melon plants. Oh yeah. In, in this picture, you see kind of just uh, left to center, there are melon vines growing in under there. And you can sort of see a tarp peeking out from underneath them. If you're going to grow melons, if you tarp underneath them, they'll grow out across the tarp and it'll keep uh, the melons and uh, up out of the soil and keep the pill bugs out of them. It works really, really well. Uh, and uh, it really uh, 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 cuts back on, on weeds growing up through them as well. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is kind of my story. I got started in 2016, a couple of tarps, 17, Begin spreading out into the forest garden area. We start getting more tarps and we start tarping underneath the orchards and we have them on the gardens and the and the berries and so forth. And then this is what it looked like last year. And uh, so the tarped areas uh, 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 um, were suppressing the, the weeds on and then opening up the areas, other areas, and either allowing crops to grow there or summer weeds to come up. And so if the weeds come up, <clears throat> we just flip the tarps from one position to the next, exposing 
the tarped area to sunlight so it brings up weeds uh, and uh, uh, then tarping the areas where weeds have come up. Now you can see out there anymore. Uh, and that's because this, this process works pretty well uh, for clearing off a fairly large area of land really pretty quickly. And uh, another shot of it. Uh, so we've really kind of got into tarps. So uh, anyway, so th this is me redistributing uh, the tarps at the end of the growing season to where the entire area, we've unfolded all the tarps. So the entire area, uh, like I said, we have about a little over of uh, 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 an acre under cover, but the area you see out in here is about three quarters of an acre. So, Scott, I, I think I'll interrupt with this question uh, after those impressive, impressive pictures. Um, how do you roll up the tarps and store them? Do you have an easy way to roll the tarps up? Uh, I fold them into quarters, long, long ways, uh, and then all the sandbags that, uh, you know, we have sitting around, I just set the sandbags on the, on top of the tarps. You can st stack the tarps up. Um, uh, you know, on top of each other if you really need to get them out of the way. But I just basically roll them up, set them to the side, do whatever I want to do. And then if uh, I want to redeploy them in the, in the fall, they're, they're ready to go. Now, probably this is the last year I'll really have to do any tarping. And then, like I said, I'm going to put the tarps and use them for the uh, liner for an irrigation pond, and then I'll be pretty well done with it. So, uh, uh, on the other hand, if anybody needs or wants to try a tarp, I'd be uh, willing to uh, let you give it a try if you want to. So uh, now uh, just shifting to where regenerative agriculture is, is taking tarmy, tarping. The, the place I really learned about uh, tarping was when this uh, J.M. Flottier um, um, presented at the OSU um, uh, small farms conference, I think it was three years ago, and he laid all of this stuff out, and he's really leading the charge in, in using tarping. Uh, that's him pulling the tarp there, and here's an aerial view of his uh, acre and a half farm, uh, and he makes a substantial living off of this farm. It's up in um, uh, Quebec, but the reason he's able to do that is his uh, expenses are very low. Everything is done by hand, um, and uh, they use tarping extensively to shift through their, through their crops. And uh, like I said, he's, he's pretty much the, the leader in this, uh, but it's beginning to expand out. And so here you have two different ways of knocking down a cover crop uh, in order to, uh, uh, for it to die off. And if you have the tractor side of it, you have to come through and you'll probably have to do three or four passes on the roller crimper in order to actually knock down the material. On the other hand, you can do it, use a uh, piece of wood, knock it down by hand, and then you can see in the background the place where they were um, knocking down that cover crop. They've uh, put the um, tarps over it in order to kill it off. And um, uh, this is at the end of summer. They're just about to put in, into the area that's tarp. They'll be putting their um, fall uh, uh, broccoli crop into it. And they will plant directly into the material that's laying there. They don't do anything with it. All you have to do is make sure it's dead. And then you can plant directly into the cover crop and it makes a great mulch for the plants, uh, protects them from frost and so forth. So that's my, uh, what I have to offer as far as regenerative farming. Uh, any questions uh, I can answer? Okay, about regenerative farming, we had some more questions. Um, so someone was asking, so this is not exactly regenerative farming, but will tarping work on gravel surface to kill, oops, to kill weeds? Sure. Like a, well, an old driveway? Know, anything that will die in the dark will die in the dark. <clears throat> so. Okay, are they using silage tarps for regenerative farming? Yes, almost exclusively. Because it's it's relatively inexperienced, it's quite durable, and it's pretty easy to handle. And then, 
Um, someone asked, how, how can the ratio, the fungal to bacterial ratio be measured? Is that something you measure or you know it's happening because of what's going on? First of Oops. all, you can observe the fungus in the soil if you, you know, kind of pay attention to it. But uh, if you want to be sure, uh, there are a number of labs now that do uh, biological analysis uh, on your soil. You take a soil sample just like you would for uh, nutritional content uh, and you send it off to the lab and it'll tell you um, just exactly what, uh, not just fungal but bacterial ratios, but whether there are any anaerobes in there, whether disease um, organisms, <clears throat> uh, which fungi are there and are they good ones or bad ones? And what bacteria are there? Are they good ones or bad ones? And those tests, um, oh, they're less than $50 the last time I, I tested and, or uh, yeah, tested the, um, uh, um, I would say the utility of having a biological test is higher than uh, looking at your nutrition content because what is becoming uh, ever more apparent uh, both in the literature and, and in the seminars I have been going to is that um, um, the way that you uh, 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 control pretty much everything that goes on in soil nutrition, uh, pr production of, of plants and so forth comes from the, the biological component. And more importantly, Fungi have the capacity to decompose virtually any mineral that's out there. That's how minerals get decomposed into soil, is fungi. And they uh, excrete um, oxalic and other organic acids. They turn them into um, mineral complexes, uh, chelates. And um, there have been several studies now that shown that if you have the right biology, you, you don't have, there is enough nutrient uh, and micronutrient in almost any soil in the country uh, that you really don't need to add any fertilizer. What you need to add is the biology that takes the existing nutrients and simply cycles them. So and in particular, if you are in regenerative agriculture, this is really common. You take all of your crop debris, you try to incorporate it into the soil as close to where the crop grew, and then uh, you're cycling the nutrients, the calcium, the magnesium, the phosphorus. Since those don't volatilize, they simply cycle through uh, the soil, but they won't cycle through the soil if you don't have the right biology. So that's what okay. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna hold it there for a minute and let Scott continue on. No, this is that's it. Oh, you're you're there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then we have more questions. Yeah. Okay. Here's a, uh, what is a good tarp that can handle sharp rock in gravel driveway? Also, do I have to pull dead weeds out by hand? They seem to not completely go away. Well, if they don't go away, it's probably something like a uh, dock or something like that. Most, most of the things I've seen, you know, uh, will go away as long as you get it dark. If, if light can leak in, then things can be different. Um, it, um, on a gravel driveway, six mil, I mean, it depends on if you're going to walk on it or anything like that. If you, you know, you don't have too much traffic on it, uh, six, six mil black poly will last, you know, a year or two probably. But if you really have, you know, if there's going to be traffic or anything, the only thing I know that will stand up to that are these, um, uh, vinyl. vinyl billboard tarps. They'll stand up to anything. You can drive over them. They're, they're really tough. So. Okay. Um, someone asked, you mentioned uncovering at night for rodent control. Does that set you back temperature wise? Would I sacrifice tarping effectiveness for rodent control? Well, it, it, at night, uh, you know, it's dark anyway. And the difference in the temperature underneath the tarp uh, you know, at night, it, there's, there, uh, it, in, in, unless you're going to have a hard freeze or something like that, where the air temperature gets substantially co colder than, than the soil, uh, the soil <laughs> temperature it, itself will maintain, you know, maintain itself over <clears throat> a night or two. 
Um, so I, I wouldn't worry too much about losing your uh, the heat from that. Um, so I think that answers. Okay. Okay. Um, someone asked, and you you mentioned a few of these, but what are the pollinator species you are using to replace grasses? Well, um, um, uh, I have just, I, I have these six or eight, what I call my uh, ally species, and I don't even have to plant them. They just come up naturally. Uh, there's, you know, the um, uh, Speedwell, the Persian Veronica, blooms all winter long, pollinators love it. Um, the purple dead nettle, the hen bit, um, uh, yeah, Phacelia will come up. So those are, and you know, I, as I've, you know, I found out they're they're not natives, but they are uh, prolific, and they're they're really easy to kill. They you know they die off really really quickly. They don't put out extensive root systems. Uh, although um, Speedwell puts out a really dense, fairly shallow but a very, very dense a root mass. And it pumps a huge amount of nutrient and carbon into the soil. And, and it dies off really pretty quickly. Oh, uh, we're really, really pleased that our uh, uh, lupine that we have growing here is really, really beginning to spread. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a legume. Uh, uh, we, we now have uh, the two varieties, the bicolor and then that, um, uh, perennial variety that, and it's blossoming right now. We've got blue bonnets or no, uh, lupine in the, in the forest garden blooming right now. Oh. Pretty cool. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's some more questions about the pollinators. And I just wanted to mention that on April 6th, we're going to have a class called uh, saving all of our pollinators. And I, uh, knowing the people that are putting the class together, I think that they will talk more about kind of what, what sorts of species support pollinators and um, just kind of, you know, the, the sort of logic behind natives or non-natives and who, who you're supporting and not. And certainly the, these plants are, are supporting some of our pollinators that um, Scott is talking about, as do native, native bunch grasses. But I think that most, knowing your place, I don't think, I think most of your grasses are non-native out there. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see here. I'm going to I'm going to scroll back through the older um, questions here and, and find some of the ones that I went by. Hold on. Let's see. Someone asked how the temperature, what temperature had you seen under your tarps? What was the hot temperature that you've experienced? The hottest I've ever seen was 130. That was in the middle of the summer. Uh, on some places I had tarp there, and I had uh, uh, it was 130 at the soil surface, and uh, about 110 at three inches. I, I understand from research done in Texas that they get up to 160 degrees without any problem. So, right, okay, yeah. Um, somebody asked, "What about using some of the felt-like plant fiber-based erosion control fabrics?" instead of plastic? Um, it, you know, it certainly works. Uh, it's fuzzy and so it all picks up all sorts of seeds and, and debris. Harvest it and use oh, it yeah. nests. Yeah. <laughs> the rodents will tear it to pieces and use it as, as nest dressing. So now what, what I'm really hoping is that the hemp industry could completely turn this around. Mm -hmm. They could come out with films and fabrics. There's absolutely no reason, you know, why uh, plastics couldn't be completely replaced in, in, the, uh, uh, in the marketplace. And considering the amount of agricultural fabrics that, that the hemp industry uses, yeah. you know, they got a built-in market there and they right. could, use, you know, move, uh, the the climate along substantially by by doing that. So I'm hoping to uh, I don't know talk to Gordon about who I talked to and up at up at the mothership about getting on board with hemp covered yeah. materials. I, I think that will happen. Okay. Um, 
this person says, I'm looking to kill off Idaho fescue to plant some ally crops in eastern Washington. Mm -hmm. If I put the tarp on in April after mowing mowing the grass down, how long mm -hmm. should I keep the tarps on? Well, eastern Washington. It, it's, it's so locally dependent. And uh, the, the way you know is look under the tarp. When, when it's dead, you know, that's when it's time to pull it up. But, you know, depending on what your aspect is and, you know, the solar aspect and, and so forth, it's a little challenging to, uh, and, and what your original soil temperatures were, for instance. You know, if you're, uh, I mean, it gets pretty cold in Eastern Oregon, so it's not going to be the same way it is over here. But right. that's the way you do it. Just look under there until it's dead and then you're done. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then Ron and Pam Hiller say, can Anna get the pictures before the class, get in the picture before the class ends? Sure. Can we, can we hear your muse? <laughs> See, <yeah. Howdy. laughs> okay. Um, and then someone says, so what is better to kill rhizome or bulb type weeds that are deep in the soil? Um, um, tarping well, or solarization? Uh, I would use, I would use tarping because I mean, you're guaranteed to kill a plant if you put it in the dark and depending on what, what plant it is, it may thrive, you know, in a, uh, under solarization. But, um, uh, since, um, I think it's always best, particularly with grasses and anything, you know, rhizominous uh, materials is to hammer it as as much as you possibly can and of course there's always that strategy that that uh gordon uh, jones always talks about is that you attack that plant when um it is is um uh, the weakest and so if you address it like in april will be a great time after it's put out all of its foliage but before that foliage can start generating sugars to replace the nutrients if you catch it once all that foliage is out there and chop it off, you do that a couple of times, the plant is going to be gone. So, uh, so I have this uh, electric weed ear that 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 uh, I call my um, battery powered goat, and it'll overgraze anything I want to, anytime I want it to do it. So that's my solution. You know, Scott, I remember you giving one of these classes a while ago and saying that this method didn't really work on bindweed. But you've obviously persisted and persisted. now you've gotten it to work. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, I know it seems like when the if the bulbs or the or the tap roots are deep down, it seems like it would be harder to change the soil temperature. But something like arum, for example, mm -hmm. eventually it's going to deplete its reserves. And mm -hmm. if you keep it from sneaking out on the edges, um, mm -hmm. you can report back and tell us how it works. <laughs> well, I, I, I have tarped. One uh, and and I mean, cut and tarped and cut and tarped uh, one particular dock plant for four years and it's still there. So just saying. But you're I probably mean, more persistent than it is, though. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, I I I just wanted to see whether or not you know how long it would go just on you know without getting any photosynthesis or anything, and all it has to put up is two little leaves you know, as in, a, in its rosette, uh, and that can hide pretty easy. And, and that's all it needs in order to keep alive long enough until things shift. But uh, with, with Doc, I just, you have to remove the root. You can't cut, cut it off. You have to remove the root if you want to assure yourself of getting rid of it. Okay. Um, and then someone asked if the slides were going to be available. And I wanted to point out that we have put some of these links that we're looking at right now on the screen, we put those into the chat. And if you want to copy the chat to your personal file on your computer, when you open the chat box, um, where you select who you're going to chat to, and it says everyone in file, and then there are the three dots. If you click on those three dots, you should be able to save the chat. As a, as a text. Mm -hmm. And I'll be providing um, a recording of this sometime tomorrow, you'll probably get it. Um, and then Scott, can you can you give us a PDF of the slides? Absolutely happy to, sure. Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have two more messages here. Oh, okay, um, tarping blackberry after mowing. It works great. 
I have killed off a huge amount of blackberry by with tarping. But the key is you have to knock it back. I mean, completely eradicate any any vegetation on it, and then uh, cover it up. And then, oh, six months for sure. Uh, it's pretty well. It's pretty well done. And I didn't. I I wouldn't have believed it. But uh, right now, I have a huge section of blackberry that I didn't even cut it down. It's just standing blackberry, like you know, three four feet tall. And I've draped the uh, uh, material over it, and I did the same thing last year, and it absolutely removed it. So, wow! Yeah. So it, it's effective on it. Okay, that's good. So we'll, we're going to stay here for a moment or two. I'm going to launch our very very simple three question poll. If you have a moment, please stay around and answer these three questions. It's our very simple evaluation. Um, you're getting some nice thank yous in there. I'm gonna launch this poll, launch the poll. And while we do that, we can still chat a little bit more. Um, okay, someone says, my question was missed. Any other tips for dealing with bunch grasses in addition to mowing the grass down before tarping? I'm specifically dealing with reed canary grass near a ponded area. Yeah, that would, uh, that would I, be I, I completely eliminated uh, 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 canary grass. In, in a moist area, it actually dies off pretty easily. I was surprised because trying to dig it out is really tough, tough. Right. but just uh, mow it down, tarp it, and, and I had no trouble at all getting rid of it. Could you go on the border between wet and dry, like on the boundary area, and tarp into the pond? No, no, this was going out away from the okay. pond, but yeah. Okay, you're getting some nice thank yous in there. Somebody else asked again, about the chat. Okay. Okay. Jamie's answering that question in the chat. Those three little dots there. Um, thank you so much. Really helpful. Lots of thank yous. And if I missed your question, do enter it again. And um, there were a long list and I was kind of um, selecting them. So we'd be on time <laughs> knowing how these things can go. But I think, I think we've gotten them all. Henry um, also says we use tarps and it worked great except for blackberry. For doc, we burn the seeds and pull it up. Make uh -huh. sure you get the whole plant covered if there are any bits outside the tarp. Yeah. Okay, lots of thank yous. Um, <laughs> we could listen to Scott and Anna for hours. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, we're having a good time, so yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I think we've got our, our polling there. That's great. So thanks so much for joining us. And folks, um, if you're interested in more pollinator plants, uh, find our, our link at OSU Land Stewards and sign up for our email if you're not getting our announcements um, about that. And that's April 6th, saving all our pollinators. So thanks so much, Scott, I think, Bet. and Anna, that was really good. It all came together. We landed on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Thank you for your help. I really appreciate it. Help and humor. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Okay, I'm going to close the meeting, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.